Reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 22 to 24. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labour in vain, nor will their children be doomed to misfortune. For they will be people blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. First of all, I ask God's approval and blessing on the words I have for you this morning. As this is my sort of baptism, so to speak, uh, I thought I'd just tell you a story. After all, no matter what age we all are, we all enjoy listening to a story. And I have to confess, this beginning of this story, that it's not based on any character or story from the Bible. I couldn't even come up with a suitable reading that would be appropriate <laughs> to my story this morning, but please bear with me. It may seem a strange choice, but I'm sure it would go down quite well. First of all, the build up to the story itself. The accommodation that Mary and I rent whilst here in Algarve, the lovely sunshine in the winter, um, is owned by a couple who spent many, many years in South Africa. They met there, they married there, they raised their family there before they tried to come to settle in the lovely warm Algarve. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I was looking through the bookshelf in our accommodation, and I came across a lovely little book with a, a picture on the front outside cover, and it was of a, a log fire. It was obviously outside because the stars were in the picture as well. It was an open log fire. On one side of the fire was a European gentleman dressed in safari-type clothing. And he was sitting cross-legged, warming his hands on the nice warm fire. And across the other side of the fire was, if I just say, a native African, also sitting cross-legged and warming his hands on the fire, but very scantily dressed, very much so. A scroll surrounded this picture, right round it. And the top of the scroll read, by the fireside. And underneath the picture, it said, true South African stories. I was intrigued. I opened the book and the first page gave you an introduction to the book itself, saying that there was a series of short stories about characters who, between the years 1700 and 1900, had left their mark in the history of this sprawling country of early Dutch settlers trying in vain to scrape a living from the dry and stony soil, of African tribal leaders feared for their level of brutality against their own natives, but also against the Dutch settlers, but leaders from both sides for their heroism, bravery and sacrifice in bringing both sides together. So I read the book. And the one story I want to tell you about really made me smile when I read it. And it centered around a small sheep farming community in South Africa called Adelaide. Yeah, yeah, Adelaide. Now you've all heard of Adelaide in South Australia. Lovely city, famous for its cricket ground. Uh, it's nearby wineries. And also a city that Mary and I have visited twice because we have a friend who lives there. On the other hand, like me, you've probably never heard of the community of Adelaide in South Africa. Very small community, about 100 sheep rearing families is all who live there. So my story is actually headed the Dutch Reformed Church in Adelaide. 
That's Adelaide, South Africa, remember. Around the year 1900, a battalion of British troops on horseback on the way to fight in the Boer War arrived in this little town of Adelaide and decided to make this place their headquarters. They took over the church building and converted it to accommodate bedding, um, dining facilities and washing facilities and even a nearby rectory to, to, they took over to provide stables for their horses without any permission from the local community. Who strongly objected to this? But of course the might of the British army prevailed and that was the position at that time. Many months later, the British army withdrew, all the way back, we assume, to the UK. And the locals got together to try and rebuild their church. Many willing hands came forward, but money was very, very tight in the whole of South Africa, not just in their community. And unfortunately, they couldn't raise sufficient funds to purchase the required materials, <clears throat> so their plan stalled. Quite some months later, <clears throat> an oxen pulled wagon train arrived in their village. It had come all the way uphill from Port Elizabeth, over 100 miles away down on the coast. On inspecting the cargo, they found it contained beautiful panels of oak wood a church pulpit, a matching chair, a lectern and other items of church furniture. The townspeople were astounded. Their very low esteem of the British army suddenly changed. <laughs> Thinking that the British army had sent this cargo in the form of an apology for their earlier misdemeanors. With the many willing hands available, they soon got the church and the rectory back into order again, totally refurbished. <clears throat> and with thankful and joyful hearts, they once again were able to praise and worship in their beautiful new building. About a year passed. A letter addressed to the local mayor arrived, and I quote this letter, unaltered. <coughs> Excuse me. So here I quote. To the Honourable Mayor Adelaide, South Africa. From the Honourable Mayor Adelaide, South Australia. Dear Sir, it is with some trepidation that we inquire whether consignment of oak wood <laughs> which was ordered from England some three years ago for our new church here in South Australia. <laughs> I'm not finished yet. <laughs> Has not, perhaps by mistake, been delivered to your hometown of South Africa instead of ours in South Australia." Unquote. How could this possibly happen, you ask? Well, you must understand the confusion in their addresses. If Mary and I were writing to our friend in Adelaide in South Africa, usual name and address, and then we type in Adelaide, and then you leave a space and a capital S dot A dot, the SA being for South Australia, no problem. <laughs> if, you happen, if you happen to have a reason to write to one of these sheep farming families in South Africa, again, name and address, Adelaide, capital S dot capital A. This time the SA standing for South Africa. So this is long before the days of postcodes and all the rest of it. So you can just understand how this could possibly happen. How could they go about sorting out this problem? The people met, they discussed it in some length and couldn't come up with a proper solution. 
So they decided all they could do was take a photograph of the new church building <laughs> and send it to the mayor, Adelaide, South Australia, with an explanatory letter explaining how the British Army had commandeered their church, etc., etc., etc. Today it's worth mentioning that this small township in South Africa has a population of about 7,000 residents and is easily accessible by good rail and road connections. But this wooden church building, built around 1900, still stands today alongside a more modern purpose-built church as a monument to a lovely but costly mistake. <laughs> As I said earlier, when I read that story, it made me smile. And I hope it makes you smile this morning. But the reason I really wanted to tell you this particular story is that, you know, here in Anmanso, we have a lovely congregation, but we don't have our own church building. So it may be worthwhile checking on the internet whether there's an Anmanso somewhere on another <laughs> continent <laughs> that one day might want to build their own church. You know, you, did, you never know what might transpire from that. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.